Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being tonight for our webcast, Stress Reduction, Happy and Healthy Shelter Dogs. I'm Jessie Collins, Education Specialist of Maddie's Fund. Due to unforeseen circumstances, our planned speaker and creator of this presentation, Dr. Sarah Bennett, is unable to join us tonight. Fellow veterinary behaviorist, Dr. Sheila Darpino, will be presenting for us in her stead. Dr. Darpino completed veterinary school and then a specialty training program in animal behavior with a focus on sheltered pets at the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. Currently, she relies upon her background working in and with animal shelters, pet foster care programs, and veterinary medicine to lead Maddie's Fund's research efforts. She is giving a fantastic presentation tonight. So hold on to your seat. Before we start, let's talk about a few housekeeping items. Please take a look at the left side of your screen, where you'll see a Q&A window. That's where you can ask questions throughout the presentation. There is a certificate of attendance for attending this live event, which you can access in the resource widget at the bottom of the page. Veterinary professionals will receive their race-approved certificate for attending this live event within two weeks. If you need help with your connection during the presentation, you can click the Help widget at the bottom of your screen. This presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours should you wish to view it again. Dr. Darpino, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Jesse. Really happy to be here tonight, and I want to begin by thanking Dr. Bennett for preparing this wonderful webcast. I certainly hope that I can do it justice in her absence. This webcast pairs with a webcast about stress that we gave a couple of months ago, and I'm going to start you guys off with doing a pulse check. You're going to see uh, your screen is going to have a green thumbs up and a red thumbs down, and I'd like you to answer this question. How many of you attended the stress webcast that we presented a couple months ago? I was the presenter. And it looks like we have about 50-50 as we see the answers coming in of the people who attended the webcast versus didn't attend the webcast, and now you've got to a view of what our pulse check is, which I'll probably be using again later. And our final tally here is about 65% who weren't at the stress one. Thanks for that. So an outline of what we're going to be talking about today. I want to tell you what the plan is to make sure I know all of your time is very valuable. I really appreciate everybody who is here in person today and everybody who's going to be watching this on demand. And the plan is to talk about the basics of enrichment, our goals of applying it and measuring its success. We have to talk a little bit more about stress in the shelter because enrichment is so closely tied to it. And then we're going to talk about um, applying enrichment in the shelter environment. So that's the plan. So beginning with what is enrichment, I'm going to be moving fairly quickly through some of these early slides um, in the interest of getting to the good stuff at the end, which is talking about actual enrichment. Enrichment is um, something that's going to change the pet's environment with a goal to improve their welfare, their physical health, and or their behavioral health. That's what environmental enrichment is to me and to most people who apply it. Enrichment focuses on the environment, um, like I said. So it focuses on looking at what a pet needs and how we can provide it. The Association of Shelter Veterinarians created the guidelines for standards of care in animal shelters, and they have a definition for environmental enrichment and have defined a purpose for it. While I'm talking about that, I'm going to put another pulse check up asking you all how many of you are aware of the guidelines for standards of care in animal shelters and have taken a look at them. And while you guys are chiming in on that, so you can see the definition up there, the Association of Shelter Veterinarians definition for enrichment. I want to talk briefly about the purposes for enrichment according to them. So we want to overall reduce stress and improve well-being by providing physical and mental stimulation. 
We want to encourage behaviors that are typical for that particular species. So cats, we want to encourage scratching, but that's not necessarily a species typical behavior for dogs unless they're scratching their own bodies. So behaviors that are typical for that species. And we want to allow animals more control over their environment. That's an important one, and I'm going to come back to that later. So it um, looks like we're about 50-50 in terms of people who've heard about the guidelines for standards of care. There's a link on the screen down there. Um, I encourage you, if you're not familiar with it, to check it out because it is a very good reference, especially when you're talking to your shelter about things that you want to implement in your shelter. It's great justification um, to have something in print that backs up what you're saying. And we have our first poll question. Thank you, Dr. Darpino. Before we jump into our first poll question, I just want to remind you that you can submit questions throughout the presentation for your Q&A window. Now let's go on to the poll question. Who should receive environmental enrichment? Only animals that have a good chance for quick adoption. Only animals showing abnormal or concerning behavior. All animals or unsure don't know. Please answer on your screen. And it looks like we have our results. Isn't that interesting, Dr. Delpino? Yes, it is. It looks like we're all on the same page here, which is a, a great, nice, easy question for everybody to start with. Yes, um, every single animal, no matter the species in our shelter environments, really would benefit from enrichment. Thank you all for answering that. When we talk about environmental enrichment, there's a trend nowadays to, to focus on environmental needs as opposed to environmental enrichment. And the reason for doing that is that when we talk about enrichment, we oftentimes think, oh, that's something nice to provide, but I don't really have the time to do it. I don't have the resources, all the reasons why it's challenging for us to do. But when we talk about it with regard to environmental needs, the things that that dog or that cat needs to maintain behavioral and physical health, it helps us to think about it in a different light and really emphasizes the importance of enrichment just as important as things like vaccinations and all the other things we do to maintain health in a shelter environment. It's, it's a crucial need that should be offered to every pet, not only when there's an emergency situation and the pet has, um, is suffering from poor welfare. And the reference down there on the bottom of the screen is about cats, but it's a really great reference about em environmental needs. I encourage you to check that out. So we talked briefly about what is enrichment, and now we're going to talk even more briefly about the goals of applying enrichment. When we're implementing something new in our environment, it's really important to have a goal because we need to define we're going to be investing resources, whether it's time or money or something else, and we need to determine whether it's worth it to invest the time and the effort. So setting a goal and defining a goal for your enrichment is very, very valuable, and there's some examples there that you can see on the screen. And we have our next poll question. Great. Uh, for our next poll question, we have, what do you think about the impact of enrichment? Of course, all enrichment is good. It's enriching, isn't it? I think maybe it isn't as helpful as we think, but I don't know how to measure that. Some enrichment is good, some is not. The response to enrichment should always be measured and monitored. Again, please answer the question directly on your screen and not in the Q&A box. And it looks like we have our results, Dr. Darpino. All right, thank you, Jesse. So it looks like most of us feel that some enrichment is good and some is not, and it should always be measured and monitored. But some of us feel that, of course, all enrichment is good. It's enriching, isn't it? I tend to agree with the people who selected the some enrichment is good, some is not, because, and it's a little bit of a trick question, but what one enrichment that's good for one dog might not be good for another dog. And one enrichment that we think might be great for dogs, 
the dogs might not actually enjoy at all. So we, it's really important to assess the effect of our enrichment to see whether it's actually benefiting our population, and that's what we're going to talk about next. So measuring the success of implementation. There's many different ways we can look at success, and the five freedoms are one way that we can look at them. I'm going to do another pulse check. How many of you are familiar with the five freedoms? or were familiar before this lecture. The five freedoms were developed by the Farm Animal Welfare Council, and so you should have a pulse check up on the screen, and right now it's looking like more of you have heard of them than have not, and that's great. Um, but they developed, this was developed by large animal people to, who were interested in improving the welfare. This was in Europe that this was done. And these five freedoms have since been applied to companion animals and specifically shelter animals. And um, here at Maddie's Fund, we actually believe in a sixth freedom that is not on this list. So the five freedoms are very well known. But there's a sixth freedom in our minds, and that is a freedom to live. And we believe very strongly in a freedom to live by finding adoptive homes for all healthy and treatable shelter dogs and cats. Because without a life, these other freedoms don't exist. And I certainly want to note that it's not always easy to achieve that, but in our minds, the effort is very well worth it. And thank you all for joining us tonight so we can work towards achieving that goal. So when we're measuring the success of implementation, our first step is to look at the results. So are we seeing actual behavior changes? Is the pet utilizing the enrichment, yes or no? And is that behavior change actually improving welfare versus doing something not so good for it? Uh, one example of an enrichment that we could implement would be to provide dogs with toys. So I'm going to implement a plan to provide a dog with toys 24 hours a day. They get to keep them in their kennels. And I'm going to rotate those toys every two days because I've read that rotating toys can um, certainly can be beneficial and the novelty makes them more interested in that. In that. So I, I'm deciding to do that as my enrichment tool. And now I want to look at behavior changes. Do they actually use those? And I want to look at whether their welfare is actually improved. And over the longer term, I want to look at things like, are we stimulating normal behavior? So are they playing with it? Play is a normal behavior. And by stimulating that normal behavior, is it reducing the frequency of less productive behaviors, behaviors like frustration and fear and aggression? So are we having more positive and good behaviors and less negative and, and behaviors that we don't like as much when we're evaluating our implementation of enrichment? Let's talk a little bit more about the toy enrichment that I just talked about, so providing a toy 24 hours a day and rotating every two days. Don't forget about the individual. So it's, it's easy when we're implementing an enrichment to put everyone on the same schedule, but important to remember that not everyone will benefit equally. So if my first enrichment toy I gave was a tennis ball and then two days later I switched to a tug toy, Dogs that really, really like tennis balls and don't like tug toys, they're not going to appreciate that rotation of enrichment toys. So think about the toys that you are providing and think about what you want. It might not be the best decision to rotate do toys in dogs, especially for dogs that have a particular interest in a particular type of toy. So bottom line, uh, novelty is good. But there is a balance between too much novelty, novelty and um, the right balance of everything. I hope that makes sense. One of the biggest stressors for dogs, in my opinion, is the lack of control over their environment and the inability to predict the occurrence of stressors. And we need to address this in our enrichment plans and to create structure and predictability in our enrichment plans. And that's why we're going to be talking about stress in this enrichment lecture. 
So speaking of, we're going to talk about stress now. We're going to talk a little bit about signs of stress and then watch a couple videos related to it. Signs of stress, we see up here on the, street, the screen, really common and probably the most common ones that I see are fear, anxiety, and frustration. And we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail soon. And fear, anxiety, and frustration often lead to aggression because we have a very scared dog where there's nowhere for them to hide. They feel need, they need to protect themselves and they turn to aggression. We have a very frustrated dog who um, can't do what he wants to do and gets more and more frustrated. That can become aggressive behavior over time. So these are often signs of stress that we see in the shelter. So behavior problems is next. Many of the behavior problems that we see in shelters can be caused by the stress of being in the shelter. So a lot of what you see here on the screen is what you saw on the last screen. And it makes it really difficult for us to know whether the results of the behavior evaluations that we're doing are what we will actually see in the home versus the result of just being in the shelter and a side effect of stress and something that we wouldn't actually see in the home. Some, this is something I think about a lot, and bottom line for me, I feel that it's important to acknowledge stress as a potential cause of the behavior problems that you're seeing in the shelter. This might be a problem that was pre-existing or will also exist in, in the home, but it might not. And while your shelter might not have the capacity to significantly reduce stress today, it's really important for us to all work towards the goal of reducing stress if we want to do what is best for our pets in our communities. And I hope that makes sense to you all. I'm going to do a quick pulse check here to see if everything's going OK or whether you're confused about things. We're going to spend a bit of time talking about kennel stress. Kennel stress is something that um, it looks like everybody is in good shape, so that's great. Thank you. Kennel stress is something that I'm guessing each and every one of us are familiar with if you've ever set foot in a shelter. And you can see the behaviors that you all see up on this slide. And kennel stress happens to some dogs when in an environment that doesn't meet their needs. I want to call out the interaction between genetics and environments because past experiences, the current environment, and the dog's genetic history all play in a role all play a role in the likelihood of whether we're going to see kennel stress in an individual dog. So we're going to go briefly into fear versus anxiety. The differentiating fear and anxiety is certainly important. Fear is a behavioral resp response to a per perceived actual danger, so there's an, there's an actual threat that might harm that dog. And this protects the dog from harm, and so it's a life-saving tool. Whereas anxiety is a reaction to a potential threat, and we have an anticipation or worry associated with it. So this is a dog who um, was attacked by another dog once four years ago, and now every dog he sees, even if it's a really, really friendly and not pushy dog, he responds very, very aggressively to, that dog probably has a pretty high degree of anxiety about other dogs. And yes, due to past experiences, but at this point four years later, that friendly dog who's approaching is a, a potential threat and not an actual threat. So anxiety is, is a very common experience for many dogs that we meet and especially in our shelter dogs and it can become maladaptive in terms of exhausting our body's stress systems so that we can't respond appropriately anymore and kind of go into a downward spiral of worse and worse anxiety which is very challenging to get out of. When we talk about fear specifically, we're talking about the fight or flight response. Some people put a couple more Fs into that um, description, like freeze, fidget, or fool around. There are other things a dog can do when, when they're really scared, but fight or flight are the main ones. And that's what a dog's deciding between when they're in a threatening circumstance. 
And when we talk about shelters specifically, there are a lot of things going on that are pot potentially threatening to them. So they're in an unfamiliar space around unfamiliar pets. They've been separated from everything that they know that's familiar. There's intense smells and sounds, lots of different things going on. And what option does a pet choose in that circumstance? It's not surprising that in many, in many situations, a pet chooses to behave aggressively because they feel that they don't have any other options because they're so overwhelmed by the stress in their environment. Now we're going to talk about frustration, and we're going to be watching a couple videos about some frustrated dogs. Frustration is another very common behavior in our shelter dogs, and we can see lots of behaviors that appear in our frustrated dogs that you can see up here on the screen. And now we're going to jump in and watch several videos. Before we do that, many scientists feel, and I just want to comment about this, many scientists feel that frustration is a manifestation of the dog's ability to cope with stress. So they're stress, stress, stress and they exhibit this behavior to help reduce and lower their stress. So the dog has no ability and to, to control things or manage their environment, limited outlets to express that stress, and these behaviors might be a way for them initially to cope with that stressor and, and help them to deal with the situation that they're in. So initially it, it might help, but is certainly a sign of poor welfare. We're going to watch our first frustrated dog here. All right, and sorry if the video quality was a little poor on that. It is an older video, but hopefully you all saw a dog that seemed to be attempting to greet Dr. DeGangi, and we saw frustrated related behaviors in, in terms of trying to kind of break his way through that cage to get to Dr. DeGangi to say hi. And while many people might look at that and see a dog who just wants to say hi, that's an incredibly frustrating experience for that dog, especially with the stressful noises in the background. Our next video is a really quick clip about another frustrated dog. So jumping, and especially repetitive jumping that over and over and over again is oftentimes a sign of a frustrated dog. If you have a dog who's doing that at home, that dog might be frustrated, but he also might just be really happy. I want to acknowledge that dogs can do many of these behaviors when they're very happy, but one of the key factors here is there's a barrier between these dogs and who they want to get to that is resulting in their frustration. And here's yet another and smaller frustrated dog. So you saw that little guy circling and circling and circling, and if you're wondering whether this was a repetitive behavior or he was just doing it at this moment, hopefully you all saw the floor of his cage that was just covered in, in food and, and other stuff, to put it politely, um, from him just circling and circling and circling because of the stress and frustration that he is displaying. It's important to note that sometimes these frustration-related behaviors can be a sign of more serious behaviors and things like compulsive behaviors. But when, you, in your, when you're in a shelter environment, assume stress first, 
treat that stress, provide enrichment, because you do that for compulsive behaviors too, and then if it's not going away, then seek the help of a professional in terms of deciding whether it's compulsive behavior, because compulsive behavior is a lot less common than frustration. And here's an interesting little video of a cute little terrier who's chasing shadows. If you watch him very closely, you'll see he's hyper-focused on the ground. And at the point when someone walks by his kennel, he just fixates on the shadow that the person creates. And this is, is impacting his ability to lead a normal life. So let's watch the terrier. So that little guy was a guy that I'd probably be a little bit more worried about compulsive behavior with, but there is certainly a likelihood just because of the intensity of the behavior and the behavior itself, but there is certainly a possibility, and I've certainly seen it more than once or twice, that this behavior is primarily related to the stress of being in the shelter. And when you initially look at that little guy, you see a cute little dog wagging his tail and he kind of looks happy and it's not until you watch him closely that you can see that this little dog is obsessed with finding and chasing shadows and it can get to the point of interfering with their ability to eat, their ability to interact with people, which obviously se severely impacts their adoption chances. I apologize that I didn't give you a lead in for that video. I should have done that. Um, I don't know how many of you caught the weaving, and so I'm going to do a pulse check right now. How many of you saw the weaving that that dog was doing, and how many of you, if you didn't see it, do the red? If you saw it, do the green? Looks like most of you saw it, which is great. I am going to play it one more time just to make sure that everybody's going to be, be able to see it because there's probably about 30% of you who weren't able to see it. The dog we moves his head rapidly back and forth, rapidly back and forth, and there's some weaving of his body that occurs in association with it. And this dog did this very, very repetitively and frequently. So let's watch that again. He does it at the beginning and at the end of the video. So hopefully you all saw that. When we think about weaving, I oftentimes think of the horses who, if you're familiar with horses, really weave their whole bodies back and forth. And in this dog, it was his head and neck that was primarily weaving very rapidly. This dog was eventually moved to a larger enclosure and given a little friend to stay with. And um, that behavior that we saw in the previous video went away, but let's see what we see now.
So we don't see the weaving, but we do see spinning and jumping and barking. So he is, um, his environment has been enriched, but he still is displaying uh, plenty of frustration-related behaviors. And this would be a dog that would be a priority for me to get into a foster home because he's not doing well in the shelter environment. So frustration, it's really common. It's jumping, barking, occurs so often in our shelter dogs, and it's a sign of an attempt to cope with a poor environment. Like I said, it can also be a sign of compulsive behavior, but that's less common. So why don't all dogs express it? If the shelter is in a stressful environment, why don't all dogs do this? And it's because of the differences in personality. Our dogs are social, but all dogs have a varying degree of sociality. And it is our more social dogs might be more stressed by being confined and not having access to people or other dogs and cause the man manifestation of this, uh, this frustration behavior. The same thing applies to working breeds or mixes of working breeds that were dogs that were bred for generation upon generation to have a job and a purpose and something to do in life. Um, these dogs uh, are dogs like you see listed up on the screen and are dogs that many of us would agree we tend to see more frustration behaviors in these types of dogs. And so this includes terriers and pit bulls are a terrier for those of you who don't know. Obviously, a lot of the dogs we have in shelters, we don't know for certain whether or not they're pit bulls. Talking specifically about pit bull terriers here. Spend a little bit of time talking about the law of effect as it relates to frustration. Our frustration behaviors likely provide some type of internal reward for the dog and that is it release, releasing endorphins, is it, is it releasing something in our pet's physiology to help them cope and, with the stress and reduce the stress, potentially. Our law of effect as it relates to frustration is any behavior that results in a pleasant consequence is likely to happen more frequently and if it results in no consequence or an unpleasant consequence, it decreases in frequency. So theoretically, we have our dog in our shelter and he's sitting there, he's hanging out and he realizes he's not getting much attention, especially if he just keeps sitting there. So he starts to try to do something else. Maybe it's jumping up. And that ends up being, could end up being a self-rewarding behavior for him. It makes him feel better. It may just be giving him some exercise and that behavior increases. It's a good thing initially until it turns into a very undesirable behavior behavior that's have, having negative consequences in terms of his adoption potential as well as for his physical and behavioral health. So that was our bit about stress in the shelter and I hope I've explained why enrichment is a need and necessary when we house pets in the confined housing conditions like shelters and I would feel that um, boarding kennels are on the same note. Um, one quick note though, while enrichment is a need, even with the best enrichment, many pets will deteriorate in a shelter environment. And the best place for a pet, especially a pet that's not going to be adopted very quickly until they find a home, is oftentimes a foster home. And so that's always something to keep in the back of your mind. Now we're going to move on and talk about enrichment. So the role of our shelters is to provide shelter and to protect public health. That's our role. That's what shelters were oftentimes formed to do. But we also have a goal in most of our shelters, hopefully, to find new dogs home, to find dogs new homes quickly. Providing enrichment is a crucial piece to enabling that to happen, keeping them physically and behaviorally healthy so we can help them to help help them and help us meet our goal of finding homes as quickly. Real life application strategies as it relates to um, enrichment, the 
we need to think about things like how do we imply the enrichment? Where do we start? How do we start? My recommendation is to start small. If you're, in, if you're implementing a new enrichment tool, start with just a couple dogs and maybe one enrichment tool and assess the response. Um, it's good to think about when you're first starting a program, although we need enrichment for every dog, starting with the, the dogs who are most in need of help, so the longer term residents and those who are, are very, very stressed. Important to acknowledge that if you're, you are in a shelter that is ho housing dogs for long term, those dogs don't always respond to efforts to reduce their stress as well as other dogs because they're so chronically stressed, it's very challenging to get through to them. So with the long, really long-term residents, it can certainly be quite challenging, and I just want to acknowledge that. So starting small, assessing the response, and don't forget to keep track of everything and, and let the adopters know what you've done to help the dogs and what the dogs like so that the adopter can bond with their pet and introduce it to things that the dog, we know the dog enjoys. So there's lots of different areas to address when we're talking about enrichment. You can see them up there on the screen. Things like changing the environment, things like social enrichment, things like learning and training, and sensory en or enrichment. And all of these impact and influence the, each other, but these are good, general, broad areas of enrichment to think about for your shelter. We're going to start off by talking about the housing environment. Housing is certainly an important factor for enrichment, and there's been a decent amount of research in this area, research that demonstrates that outdoor access can be helpful to dogs and that providing them with a larger space can be helpful, uh, reduce stereotypy, and um, by its very nature, Providing outdoor housing and or group housing increases the physical complexity of the environment and therefore is enriching. Obviously, um, that can be challenging for many of us, but um, I want to say right now that if you can't build a new shelter or change your housing, there's lots of other things that you can do. And some of the best shelters that I've ever been to are shelters that have not the best in the world housing situations, but do a great job of providing enrichment. Beds, got to spend a little bit of time talking about beds. So there's certainly research about beds too and the ability to help our dogs. Beds are, are certainly a source of comfort for our dogs. We also have research that moving the bed to the front of the cage increases the dog's time at the front of the cage, which, which is a good thing in terms of visitors seeing them. Another note about beds and raised platforms. So some older research, you can see the reference down there, found that raised platforms were used by over 50% of dogs and it helped to improve behavior. If you're looking for more information about the raised platforms that were used in this study, uh, Google the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals and you'll be able to find it. But they had pretty fancy raised platforms that they built. A raised platform can also be a kennel in the dog's uh, space. So you can crate train the dog and also give him a place to jump on top of at the same time. And that's something that I love to do. So that was a brief talk about the physical environment. Now we're going to spend a bit of time talking about the social environment, starting with dogs and then talking about social interaction with people. In my opinion, this is the most important form of enrichment. And when I think about this, I think about my own dogs, but I also think about a dog who is owned by a homeless person. I see so many super, super happy homeless dogs who are, who are partnered with a homeless person um, that are not stressed or not displaying all the behaviors that we've been talking about here because they have that social interaction with their person and a lot of social interaction with their person. So if there's only one thing I can do in terms of enrichment, social interaction is what I like to do. Group housing is great if we can do that. 
Uh, when we talk about con specifics, we're talking about dog-dog interactions. And we, as you can see up on the screen, it can satisf satisfy biological needs for physical exercise, and it can also provide social contact. Important to acknowledge that not every dog wants social contact, and so some only want contact with specific types of dogs. So we tailor the enrichment to the dog. Lots of research to support what's on this slide here. And a bit of information about group housing, and so you can see other research links there. Group housing is good. Um, it's a good thing for our dogs. It can help dogs to find homes and can result in less aggression. So whenever you can do it, consider group housing. What about social interaction with people? that people can interact with dogs in many different ways, so in stimulating ways in terms of giving them exercise and fun and play, but also in calming ways like quiet time. People interaction can be both positive and negative, though. So if we're doing things like play or training or quiet time, that's positive. But as you see in the second bullet point there, if people are walking by the kennels and not stopping to say hi to the dogs, that can be frustrating to the dogs and we have see increased dog activity and barking. So we need to think about both positive and negative effects of everything that we're doing. There's lots of research about contact with dogs and petting with dogs and the benefits of petting on reducing dog stress. Um, enough evidence that it's something that I very strongly recommend. Um, it helps our dogs and it helps us too, because I don't know about you, but uh, petting my dog certainly helps me to feel happier. But negative human interaction, as we talked about, can potentially increase stress and frustration. And as you can see in that first bullet point, is visual access and providing it detrimental to dogs because they don't get contact with the people and they're frustrated? Potentially, yes, especially for our fearful dogs. But at the same time, I want to say, is solitary confinement better? Meaning if we put them in an environment where they can't see people, they can't see other dogs, they might be quieter, but um, they might be really unhappy because there's no stimulation at all. So we need to find a balance with the right amount of stimulation versus not stimulation and provide that individually for each dog. And I think we have our next poll question. Thank you, Dr. Darpino. Before we jump into this poll question, I just wanted to remind everyone again that you can submit questions throughout the presentation through your Q&A window. Now let's move on to the poll question. What are your thoughts about training as enrichment? It's nonsense. I'm listening. I absolutely consider it a form of enrichment, or you're unsure or don't know. Please answer the question directly on your screen and not in the Q&A box. And here are our results. Looks like it's mostly the third one, but a little bit varied. What do you think, Dr. Darcino? Thank you, Jesse. Um, I'm hoping that those of you who said I'm listening and didn't say I absolutely consider it as a form of enrichment said that because it depends on the training and how that training is provided. And if that's why you said it, I certainly agree because, yes, it is oftentimes a form of enrichment, but if you are using tools that are aversive and damaging to the dog, that's certainly not enriching to the dog um, when you're providing it. All right, so we're, gonna, we're still talking about social enrichment and we're gonna talk about play. Play groups are a form of exercise for our dogs and they're very likely beneficial. And they can have the potential to improve dog welfare, they have the potential to improve staff morale, they have the potential to allow our staff to get to know the dogs better so that they can do a better job as adoption counselors and that's certainly something I've seen firsthand after implementing playgroups in the shelter where I worked. 
spot. I, and there's a great webcast that Maddie's son put on that you can view about playing with shelter dogs. I do want to acknowledge, though, that playgroups do need to be managed and controlled and humane techniques used in managing the dogs because just like any enrichment tool, we can put in this situation, we can put a dog who doesn't enjoy other dogs in a playgroup and he's just stressed, stressed, stressed the whole time and doesn't want to be there and that is not enriching for him. So every pet we need to look at as an individual. Going to jump through the next two slides here in the interest of time with regard to behavior modification and training. There's a lot of material out there to talk about providing behavior modification and training for our shelter dogs and I encourage you to uh, go to some of these links. When we look at research related to behavior modification and training, we certainly have research that tells us that dogs who received training were more likely to be adopted and dogs who received a food toy and training at the kennel also showed better behavior. So we certainly have evidence that training is beneficial and I want to emphasize that the training that was used in these studies was all positive reinforcement training. And I am not seeing this slide right now. It doesn't look like it pulled up. I'm going to try to move to the next one. I apologize if you can see it, but I can't. All right. So a couple general things to consider when we are uh, applying enrichment to shelters with regard to people, and that is consistency of interactions and teaching people to respond to relate to, pay, to pets in a way that is most likely to be beneficial to them. And oftentimes that's being calm, quiet, being patient, being positive, thinking about how we're restraining our dogs and learning about low stress handling and learning about fear-free veterinary practices, super valuable not forcing any interactions. So not just thinking about specific things that we can do like Kong toys, but thinking about how our animal handling is occurring and what we can do to reduce stress and enrich lives. All right, going to spend this last bit of time talking about our senses. And um, there will be a little bit of time at the end for questions. But first, our dog's primary sense is smell. So very different from people, but smell is our dog's primary sense. And hearing is another very strong sense for dogs. Let's start by talking about sight, though. Dogs don't have great visual acuity. They're not great at seeing details. Um, I have a great story behind this, but unfortunately no time to tell it to you right now. But something to pay attention to is does your dog see the details of people that they meet? Oftentimes they don't. Dogs see movement very well, but not fine details. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot about sight other than talking about light, because don't underestimate the power of a normal routine. Maintaining normal circadian rhythms and the, the cycle of light versus dark is super important for maintaining health. So turning the lights off in the evening uh, can make a difference for shelter dogs who are experiencing stress, and it's a very important part of, of taking care of them. So what about sound enrichment? Hearing is a really strong sense for dogs. It's really important to think of an, the positive and the negative effects of enrichment in terms of one way we can enrich environment is by taking away bad sounds. So really noisy barking dogs, teaching our dogs not to bark, putting sound dampening materials in our enclosures. The sound of stressed barking dogs increases other dogs' stress. So the more we can do to help that and the more we can encourage quiet, um, just like a person in the hospital who never gets any sleep because everything going on, the same applies to our dogs. As far as music goes, uh, music has certainly been demonstrated to be enrichment, enriching. You can see the 
the reference there, specifically classical music. Dogs who listen to classical music spent more time resting and less time standing, so it's calming. And if you want your dogs to bark, play heavy metal. Smell. So smell is our dog's primary sense, and I hope many of you are involved in games like nose work for dogs because it's, it's very fun and enriching for them. But there are different things we can do in the shelter environment to influence how our dogs are responding to the environment. We can use pheromones, which can potentially reduce stress and anxiety. We can also diffuse essential oils, and chamomile and lavender have been shown to be more calming, whereas rosemary and peppermint have been shown to be more exciting. So in an older dog who seems depressed, you might want to try that peppermint. But for a lot of dogs, a chamomile and a lavender scent would be what I would turn to. Taste. Dogs like food. I think most of us know that. Our stressed dogs oftentimes don't eat. But in general, our dogs like to taste things and they like food, but many of them aren't very discerning. They'll eat almost anything. But when we're looking at the senses and looking at enriching the environment, using food to enrich that environment, because many dogs love it so much, can be really useful. So in the form of food dispensing toys like the dog you see on the slide, this, and you see the Kongs in the other picture, a great form of feeding our dogs and giving them enrichment at the same time. But really important to monitor to make sure that they're using it and they're eating it um, so that they're getting, meeting their caloric needs. And then touch. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but when we're talking about touch and tactile, the tactile sense, that can be things like petting and then the tactile nature of different toys. And one quick note about toys, it's valuable to find out what, pet, what toy a pet likes to play with. We have research that tells us that the encouraging the pet to play with a potential adopter. If that dog plays with the adopter, the dog's more likely to be adopted. So I encourage you to find out what your dogs like to play with and then encourage your adopters to use that particular type of toy, whether it's retrieving or tug or something else. So we're getting short on time and I want to have time for questions, but this I'm going to go through this slide super, super quickly. We need to think and talk about schedules of rotation. So when we're talking about things like toy, like I talked about earlier, we might not want to rotate toys that much because if a dog loves a tennis ball, give him the tennis ball and let him have it. But if he's bored with it and doesn't like it anymore, then we should consider something else. Providing enrichment at scheduled time so that we can have as much consistency and routine in the environment as possible. So in conclusion, we're nearing the end here, and I'm going to just talk about what I see as key takeaways from what we've spent the last 50 minutes talking about, and that is that all dogs should receive enrichment, and that enrichment should be tailored for each dog. Monitoring for both positive and negative changes should be part of the plan of assessing the enrichment. Think about what you do for a dog who really likes routine and structure or really likes a certain type of toy. Rotation of enrichment toys isn't always good. Use everything that you've learned about housing, social interaction, training, and sensory enrichment um, and figure out what's best for the dogs in your care. Be creative. Start competitions within your shelter among staff and volunteers to see who can come up with the best new inexpensive enrichment tool to help the dogs in your care. You'll be surprised at what people come up with. And overall, don't forget about the why we provide enrichment. It is a need, not a bonus. You might not be able to provide it to all of your shelter dogs, but you should acknowledge, if, if you can't provide it, that lack of enrichment is causing some of the problems you might be seeing. And those problems don't mean that that dog is necessarily a bad dog. It means that we need to improve the enrichment that we're providing. And that's always something that I try to keep top of mind when I see a dog with a behavioral issue. What else? Uh, 
enrichment reduces stress on a very basic level. And stress reduces illness. We certainly have research to demonstrate, demonstrate that. So an enrichment program benefits your medical program. And knowing about behavior and being able to interpret body language is an important piece of all this that we really didn't spend a long time, didn't spend much time talking about here, but looking at the dog's emotional states and motivations and figuring out who's most in need of immediate intervention and setting up plans and evaluating those responses, those are the steps we need to take. All right, thank you for your time. This is Dr. Bennett, uh, who I want to thank again for uh, providing this lecture and my contact information. And I think we're ready for questions. Yes, we are. Thank you so much, Dr. Darpino. It looks like we do have some time for some questions. And here is our first question. Due to liability concerns, I am told my shelter will never use playgroups. What alternative can you recommend for social interactions? So liability concerns are always a huge issue for shelters. I wish we thought more about the liability concerns of not meeting our dog's enrichment needs and um, dog suffering because of that, because that is obviously a consequence. But alternatives, um, alternatives are taking dogs on walks play with people, training by people. So if they're not allowing dog-dog interaction, you really need to rely on people interaction. Hope that answers your question. Thank you, Dr. Darpino. And on to the next question. How do you recommend we combat the frustration caused by having people walking by? Is talking to them even if we do not stop good, or do we ignore the dogs? Really good question, and thank you for adding that. And my answer is that it depends. I know a shelter in the Bay Area, uh, Berkeley Humane, that they had a fire, and because of that fire, their potential adopters don't have access to walk by the dogs anymore. So they started using a book um, that people could see pictures of the dogs, and they talked about the dogs, and people can obviously look at them online, that they talk to the people and help to direct the people to the dogs who are most suited for them, and then they brought the, the dog to the people. So um, that was something that one shelter did, and it's working very well for them, and it's potentially something that other shelters can do is just change your policy in terms of how people meet dogs and start with talking to them and then having them meet dogs. That's certainly something to consider. And then the next part of things is talk, but I'd love to see research on this to get more solid information about it. The second part is talking to them, even if we don't stop good or do we ignore the dog. I will... I don't have research about this, but I believe in talking to the dogs because is it more frustrating that you're talking to them? I like to treat dogs as I would like to be treated, and if I were stuck in a cage and couldn't get out, I would appreciate uh, people talking to me as, a, as opposed to just walking by and ignoring me. But it's also going to depend on the dog, right? For some dogs, that if you if you try that and you're doing that and you find that that's making dogs more frustrated, then you probably shouldn't do that with that individual dog. Great. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, looks like we have time for about one more question. Um, if routine and structure are so important and keeping a favorite toy, how should compulsion be handled? So that is a, um, a really interesting question, and I wish I had another 10 minutes to talk about this because, and if, you, if whoever sent this question wants to talk about it more, I encourage you to email me because um, I had a really interesting case with this with a dog um, years ago. The compulsion should be handled by, if you're talking about the compulsion of related to an individual do toy and a dog who is compulsively attached to an individual toy. I hope that's what you're talking about and that's how I'm interpreting this. My focus for these dogs is doing lots of other things to enrich the dog's environment and work on teaching a drop it command and a leave it, sorry, a drop it cue and a leave it cue to teach that dog to let items go when we ask them to, first working with toys that are less valuable and then more valuable. But I, I've certainly firsthand experienced where a dog has a favorite, favorite toy that they are, are 
seem to be almost compulsively attached to. And if that's helping the dog by making a less ideal experience handleable for them, in my opinion, I want to allow that dog to keep having that toy. So I don't know if that's answering the question, but I hope I hope that it is. Thank you, Sheila. Um, it looks like we are out of time. Um, so this is the end of our event tonight. We want to thank Dr. Darpino and all of you for your time tonight. Be sure to join us on July 21st for our next webcast update on canine distemper virus with Dr. Sandra Newberry. More information on this webcast will be arriving in your inbox soon. This webcast will be available on demand shortly, and we hope you will share this presentation on your social sites. Thanks again here with us this evening, and good night.